There we are. You know, you look so much younger without the beard. I, I should probably do that too. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, man. If you do that, you're going to start getting carded. I mean, if they have <laughs> open up places to card people again. Well, no, you know, I have a, I have a, I have a five o'clock shadow at uh, five minutes after I shave. So I, I've actually almost never been carded. Did anybody else just freeze or was it just me? Smooth on my side. No, all good. <laughs> well, this might be interesting. I just got a notice saying that once again, my internet connection is unstable, which is... But it's not a reflection on you, John. Thank you, Michael. I feel better already. It's going to make some wisecrack, and then I remembered we were recording. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, it does kind of make sense, Phyllis, that if anything is going to be unstable, it would be during a psychology brown bag. <laughs> This is a safe space and we can all be on this table right now. <laughs> I was just going to blame Hillary's emails, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very unstable response. Oh, sorry. Um, well, I guess in the next minute or so, I'm going to get started. Um, I hope everybody's comfortable and uh, if you have questions as we go along, feel free to interrupt. What I'm presenting is gonna be an idea that sort of goes forward. So I'm planning on having a discussion afterwards, but if there's something you wanna talk about as we go forward, let's do that. So I'm gonna start sharing my screen and uh, we'll get started in, within the next minute. There we are. Can everybody see that okay? Thank you, John. All right, so I'm just gonna wait for the minute to tip over on my computer and then we'll get started. And there we go. Okay, folks, well, it's nice to see you. Thanks very much for showing up. And I, I hope that this is uh, time well spent for you. It's a, a strange world we're living in right now. And time seems kind of precious, but it also seems like we've got too much of it. I want to talk to you about how we can have contradictory feelings like that. And I want to propose to you a way of dealing with it. So I've started here with this picture that uh, Jonathan drew based on uh, iterations and attempts by Nico and myself and Jonathan. Um, this is supposed to reflect brain stress. The idea that uh, sometimes thinking just causes you stress, whether it's the things you're thinking about or whether it's the thought process itself. Uh, this is also one of only two pictures in this deck. So I'm warning you ahead of time, this is not going to be the most exciting deck you've ever seen. Usually I like to have a lot of pictures. That won't be the case now. There's a reason for that. And we'll get to that as we go along. So, let's see. There we are. So I want to talk to you, as, as I've said to some of you individually and some of you in groups, I want to talk to you about anxiety and grief right now in the face of this pandemic we're living through. And it seems probably a strange combination to talk about anxiety and grief, but there, there's a reason for that. So I'm gonna make a few points to you, about half a dozen points uh, over the course of the next 20 or so slides. And uh, I wanna start with the idea that we are association machines. And that might seem kind of strange. Uh, we like to think that we're lots of things but basically all of the learning we do from the time that we're babies until the last learning we ever do is all based on making connections, mental connections between the things we are faced with and the things we know. And we do it really badly. I mean, don't get me wrong, we do it really well. Otherwise none of us would be able to speak or understand speech or walk or, or make or drink coffee. but we do it really badly because it would be great if, as many of us think, we could reach out to the new information and let that tell us what to think.
lost audio. Still hear me. Oh, uh, is everything still working there, John? You're back. Just now. Came back. Came back. Okay, so I did freeze for a while. The Great. last thing we heard was reach out. Thank you. So what I was saying is that it'd be nice if we could take new information and use that as the basis for how we understand the world, but we're always adding new information to our existing mental models, our existing mental maps. And that's where prejudice comes from, and that's where fast opinions come from, and deep-rooted feelings that you trust more than your own judgment, and things like that. So we are association machines is point number one. Point number two is that the human brain isn't one brain. It's actually three different processors working at three different speeds. The fastest one, the one that controls your reflexes, real reflexes, not like, oh, I just reflexively vote for this hockey team. No, that, that's, that's not a real reflex. But real reflexes, like the patellar one that the doctor stimulates with a little hammer, or your siblings used to stimulate every time they walked past you just to frustrate you. Um, those are reflexes, they're the fastest things, and they supersede the next fastest, which are our quick emotional reactions, where we recognize a pattern, a simple graphical or geometric or spatial pattern, and we react very emotionally. The slowest one is our rational thoughts. The processor that enables us to think with numbers and letters and logic is really, really slow. And that's because the fast reactions happen in older parts of our brain that are vital to existence. So it only kind of makes sense that stopping to think deeply about something would involve stopping. It only makes sense that the ability to survive is more important than the ability to think deeply, especially if you think of where we came from, uh, clustering in nests uh, up in trees. It's just a good evolutionary strategy to have that kind of separation, right? Unfortunately, there are times when, as when faced with a, a pandemic, something that we can't quite wrap our heads around, something where we can't see the end of it, those instincts that say, survive, 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 really aren't useful because our reflexive response to how to survive has nothing to do with surviving a pandemic. Sometimes we have to say to that really old part of the brain, just slow down, right? And uh, I think maybe during the freeze or something, we missed a slide, but the, um, if you want, we can imagine that the brain, these three different levels of it, are your intellect, the part of you that's listening to this conversation that sits in the prefrontal neocortex. That's that big wrinkly six layer deep tablecloth that's crammed into your head that you always see when people draw brains or show brains in movies. That sits on top of the sort of uh, amygdalic region, which is where you have emotional reactions, but also uh, fast reactions. It's the amygdala and the, the limbic system is what it's usually called by people who talk about three levels or two levels of brain. And then all of that sits above the spinal cord and the cerebellum, where your reflexes either happen or where groups of reflexes happen and are coordinated, like dribbling a basketball or chewing without biting your tongue or uh, making the vowel sounds that allow you to say, ooh, ah, instead of something else. Um, so that, that, that middle point is sort of like a, a prosimian's brain. That, that's the old mouse-sized creatures that were our great-great-grandparents. And that great-great-grandma that we all have in our head, what a mental image, speaking of anxiety, that great-grandma we all have in our head is scared of everything all the time. That's how we survived when we were about the size of mice by being scared of everything all the time. Now, the third point I want to make for you You froze. The, uh, the, the sixth stage, uh, which is finding meaning, which is what you do when you come out of grief, you try to find meaning for it. We're actually grieving. And it, it seems strange because we're scared, right? We're not grieving, but we are grieving. We're grieving for the normal lives that we should be living right now. Some of us are grieving for baseball and some of us are grieving for that 
great uh, that great uh, hamburger stand or taco stand down the street. And to some degree, all of us are grieving for each other's company. But we're grieving for what we've lost. And more than that, we're grieving for what we might be about to lose which is a terrible kind of grief because it's hard to deal with. It's, it's a form of anxiety. And basically anxiety is described as, as usually described by people in the field of psychology as being comprised of a few different types of fear. And if you look at the list here, wow, they sort of all apply right now, don't they? There's no doubt that a pandemic is catastrophic and we all feel like we're being judged all the time because we're trying to work and carry on as normal when Darn it. one that certainly we've lost control when was the last time you thought, I absolutely do not want to shake anyone's hand this week? Now, admittedly, a few of us, that's our superpower. We never want to shake anyone's hand, and we can probably deal with the social isolation a little bit better than the others. But the worst of it is uncertainty. The fact that we don't know what's going on, we don't know what's going to happen next, and we don't have any obvious pattern we can follow to control it. We can follow the advice of one group or another one person or another about how to control it, but none of it feels right. None of it feels normal. So you may find yourself with the usual physical or emotional symptoms of stress. And if you think that's just how it feels on Monday morning, I would agree and advise you to reconsider your Monday morning routine or maybe your Sunday night routine. What I'm trying to say by showing you this is that what we're all going through, what you're going through individually, and I don't mean to minimize that by including all of us in it, it's normal. It's understood. And it's not your fault. It's serotonin. Serotonin pounding out of your brain and making everything edgy and anxious, just like people who suffer from clinical depression. Of course, it's not just serotonin. It's also a bunch of other drugs coursing out of our brains, coursing out of our other systems. Some of it actually controlled by uh, reflexes and, and, and uh, gases and, and liquids coming out of our stomachs as well. It changes the reaction to some of these from happy to stressful. Either way, it's a biochemical reaction. And when you're isolated, truly isolated or feeling isolated, that makes it worse. Now, it's easy for me to say that and sound empathic, but it really does make it worse. And knowing that that makes it worse gives us a direction to go to try to do something about it. It makes it worse because reliable interactions with the world around us, with the people we know and with the people we don't know, things that are familiar and reliable, that gives us the ability to self-calibrate, to check out how we're doing. And we do that all day, all day, every day. How are your legs working? How are your hands working? How is your mind working? How is your heart working? We're checking all of these things in our regular interactions with the world around us. And unconsciously, we are being comforted by the fact that these things are behaving the way we expect them to. We're getting the feedback that tells us everything is okay. And right now we are getting none of that feedback. So I mentioned that the amygdala, the, that emotional part of the brain, is in charge of our conscious thoughts. It overrules them. It decides how we feel that things are going and how we think that things are going. And it decides what we can do about it. And like I said, it's scared all the time. So I mentioned the prefrontal neocortex, six layered tablecloth wrinkled up and crammed in your head. That's the part, like I said, that can count and read and perform logic and can reason its way through things rather than just reacting emotionally. But like I said, your limbic system naturally controls and overrules your intellect. Now, you may find that hard to believe, 
But I promise you, it's this hierarchy. Most people who talk about it in the field of psychology and in other fields, they talk about it as though it's inverted, as though the part of your brain that's listening to this right now and that can, that can uh, perform math or coding or write a sonnet or appreciate any of those things performed by someone else at more than an emotional level. We, we like to think that's the part that's in control. But if that's the part that's in control, why is it hard to stay calm when someone is upsetting you while you're doing something intellectual? If that's the part that's in control, then why is a conversation interrupted by the need to sneeze? Right? The controls come from the bottom up. Our reflexes control our emotions, or at least override them, and our emotions override our intellect. And I know that's not very reassuring when I've just said it's our emotions that are driving us around the bend right now. But because it's your brain, you can influence it. And there's a few known strategies. Exercise. Everybody who loves exercise will say exercise helps. And everybody who thinks they'd like to love exercise will say exercise helps. I find it helps. That should mean absolutely nothing to you. Please try it if you feel like trying it. And if you really, really don't feel like trying it, if you really think like that would just be a waste of time, maybe ask yourself why you have such a strong opinion. Maybe that's your amygdala. Maybe that's that ancient primate in your brain saying, no way. Consciously addressing the thoughts that you're having is a really good way to consciously address your fear or anxiety or grief or depression. And it seems ridiculous. You might hear that statement and think, Okay, John, now we know why you're a theoretical psychologist and not a clinical psychologist. You're the guy who says to the depressed person, cheer up. To the anxious person, calm down. Well, strangely, it works. What doesn't work is listening to the prosimian. If you do that, if you just say, yeah, I need to get drunk every day you'll feel good for the first little while. I mean, specifically with alcohol, which is a depressant, so it makes you feel good for a little while before the depression kicks in. But whether you escape into wine or CBD or Netflix or whatever else it is that helps you get through a rough day in normal life, those are short-term strategies. That's listening to the prosimian when it's screaming, run. And that does feel good. There are chemical rewards based on that that happen in your brain. But the problem is, if you do that, then you're deliberately choosing not to think consciously about the problem. And so many people have said that to me. I don't even want to think about it right now. I don't want to think about it. I'm not watching the news. I'm not reading anything I did for the first few. I'm, not, I'm done with it. I don't want to think about it. But thinking about it slowly, consciously, with that folded, wrinkled tablecloth, that gives us some control. Now, I'm not suggesting this is the secret and that by thinking the right thoughts, you prevent tidal waves or nonsense like that. Uh, I mean, if you can do that, please form the X-Men and save us all. But what I'm suggesting is that thinking with the thoughtful part of your brain, the part of your brain that reads words in sequence, not the part of your brain that reacts to pretty pictures, Thinking with that part of your brain slows things down and lets that part of your brain be in control for a while instead of the terrified prosimian. That's what this whole talk has been about. That's the strategy I have to share with you. Slow down and read something, do some math, follow a pattern that isn't obvious. Read something you've never read before right when your brain is screaming at you, but I want comfort, I want to do what I know. Do the opposite, solve a puzzle, solve a crossword. Read a poem you've never read. Write a poem you've never read. When you think with the thoughtful part of your brain, the panic goes away, the anxiety goes away. And what's more, you then have the ability to form some simple understanding like the fact that the world has survived pandemics before and will again. Like the fact that 
you will be better off surviving, trying to survive, if you're calm, sometimes at least, rather than scared all the time. And when you start doing that, you'll start noticing the people around you who aren't. All of us are really, really stressed these days in this unconscious way that makes people's reactions short and angry. Take a deep breath, read something that challenges you, think about something that's hard to solve. And if you find you absolutely don't want to keep doing it, consider that motivation to try. And if you find that you do want to keep doing it, then please reach out and let me know, because I'd love to have a talk like this individually or as a group again. That's it for the presentation. If there's anything you'd like to raise or talk about, please just say so.